Every Tuesday, Reddy Newman Brown does bring in immigration updates. Along with me is my business partner, Emily Newman. Emily, what do we have today to discuss? Today, we want to talk about National Interest Waiver or NIW I 140s. Um, can you file it yourself? How can you use this if you are in your sixth year of H 1B? You're and getting towards your six year limit and your perm is still not approved. Your company is late to start the perm process. Um, how can you use the national interest waiver I-140 to be able to continue to extend your H-1B? Um, we're also going to talk about um, an issue with traveling on a B-1 or B-2 visa. Uh, if you or family members are coming into the U.S. and you don't have the return airline ticket, you're at risk of not being let into the country and being deported back to your home country at the airport. So be very careful of that. We'll talk about what we've been hearing in that situation. Uh, we'll talk about the H-1B grace period uh, for people who are dealing with a job loss situation. What do you need to know in order to uh, smoothly transition either to another type of visa or to a new employer? And lastly, how to handle a rejected H-1B transfer? Uh, what happens if you filed that transfer, your H-1B gets denied, depending on whether your I-94 is still valid, depending on whether you're still with your previous employer or did you join the new employer on the receipt notice, what are the steps and options to overcome that denial and get back in status? So Emily, a couple of things that uh, on the national interest waiver, what is national interest waiver? I know I see that there are three prongs that we need to prove, which is that the person is, has substantial merit, which has, has to be national importance, and he is going to advance that particular uh, uh, skills that he has. And it is in the best interest of the United States to waive the labor certification because of that particular endeavor that he is in. But doesn't it require a labor certification to file an I-140? No. So there are certain I-140 um, criteria or categories that you skip the labor certification and national interest waiver or NIW is one of those. So you can go straight to filing an I-140 petition. You skip the prevailing wage determination, which is taking six months to process. You skip the um, advertising process, the recruitment steps for your labor certification. You skip the whole perm, terrible 13 month processing times, and you go straight to filing an I-140 and you file it yourself. You don't even need the company to do that. So it can speed up the time it takes to get an approved I-140 particularly if you are in a pinch when it comes to your six-year limit of your H-1B. Emily, a couple of questions that I have when, especially there are a lot of layoffs going on with big companies though, and for them to file the labor certification or perm labor, some people call car perm and from some people call labor certification, um, they need to prove that there is no U.S. workers available for that kind of position, especially if a company is having a layoff, though, they in that particular segment where the person is working, uh, they, the, the companies cannot find the labor certification. Now, we see that a lot of major companies, at least a good number of major companies, are not filing the labor certification. They put a hold on the labor certification. And I have to object to one of the things that you said to uh, in the labor certification timing is 13 months. That is completely wrong. She did not include the prevailing wage and the recruitment time and all those things. Now, that's going to add up to more than two years. I think so you'll agree with me on that, Emily. But now you said that the employee can file by themselves. Don't they have to do the labor market test? They don't, they don't have to do the prevailing wage, Emily? No, no prevailing wage, no labor market test. Basically, Congress decided that because this person's work is in the national interest, in the best interest of the United States, that we don't need you to go through all of that. We don't need you to delay filing. And we want you to go straight to I-140 filing to normally get the green card uh, faster, of course, with EB-2 for uh, India and China and EB3 being backlogged, that doesn't really help getting the green card faster, but it does help getting the I-140 faster, uh, which can be useful. So no employer required, no labor certification, no prevailing wage, no notice of filing, um, just filing the I-140 by yourself. 
Uh, is there a premium processing for this, Emily? Yeah, even in premium processing. Uh, if, if, uh, if for, give me some examples of it. Recently, yesterday, I had a consultation with a guy where the company um, decided to shelf his labor certification. When I was speaking with him, he was working for one of the big wireless uh, uh, you know, company, uh, and of course, Verizon company is working with, where the end client is Verizon, but he's actually not working for Verizon. He's working as a consultant, but he's one of the top security. Uh, he's into the security, which uh, prevents other people, other country people to come in and 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 uh, access the information. He's one of the top architect in those things. And I said to him, hey, you know, forget about the labor certification. Let's just go through the, uh, through the national interest waiver. Can you give some of the examples, Emily, where people can get national interest waivers without going through the labor certification process, of course? Yeah, the great thing is there's no set list. Um, so you just have to show that whatever your field of endeavor, whatever you're planning on doing, has a uh, substantial merit and um you know for example healthcare if you are working on healthcare devices and you've got uh, experience doing that for the last i don't know five years and you the work that you're doing is going to advance something uh in the healthcare industry that is nationally important that is something that the united states thinks is a good thing for the country and so they will consider that to be something of national importance and intrinsic merit. Um, anything with manufacturing, cybersecurity, as you mentioned, um, there, that's, that's the hard thing is you can't really list all the possibilities because it's really down, comes down to, can you show um, how this particular field, you get, you get to decide the field. I mean, you've got to have the experience in it, but you, get to frame the field that you're going to be in and then tell your story about how it's going to benefit the United States um, and can provide that uh, national importance. Emily, you cited a couple of things. One is that healthcare, you said manufacturing. Um, could could we also look into more into IT profession? You said cybersecurity probably is one of the things, especially if people are working for banks, for major uh, organizations where cybersecurity is one of the major things. Right now, wars are conducted on the cyber first and then comes to the major war. So cybersecurity definitely falls into the national interest. So school districts may also fall into, you know, being a being a teacher also falls into the national interest waiver too, if they are uh, in a you know particular segment where they are doing very good. I think so school teachers should also be able to get the, can you cite some of the IT professionals, Emily? I'm definitely an AI right now. I mean, STEM. I mean, <laughs> IT is STEM in general, but um, yeah, if you're developing software that is going to, um, you know, a lot of people work for state government agencies on their software that's benefiting the people of that particular state, that might count. Um, it's all about just making the argument, I feel like. So AI, you said, is definitely one thing that people need to consider. Cybersecurity, uh, definitely data, uh, you know, all those things, they should evaluate into those things. So uh, if anybody wants to contact to get their evaluation done, the perfect person in our office would be Kareem Jivani uh, and uh, Rebecca Chen and uh, also Ryan Vick. These are the three people we suggest that you have a consultation with. Emily, anything else before we go to the second topic? Uh, no, I think we can move on. Um, a lot of people we have noticed recently got, uh, not a lot of people, I would say some people got deported when they were coming into United States. They were coming with one way ticket into United States. These people are coming on either B1 or B2 visa. They have been sent back, their visas have been cancelled though. Whenever B1, B2 people are coming into United States, they have to show a couple of parameters for them to be allowed into the country that they have enough financial resources, they're not going to be a burden on the United States, they're coming only to visit the United States. Now, whenever the CBP, that means when you come into the uh, port of entry at the airport, you see those officers, they're considered as customs and border protection people. When they see the people coming with one-way ticket, it creates an entire dilemma for them. Whoops, 
this guy is coming one way. He's not going to go back outside the country. Let me check into his WhatsApp. Let me check into all the details. So we strongly suggest, or not only strongly suggest, absolutely requirement to have the return ticket already purchased, paid for. Don't come into United States on B1, B2 on a one-way ticket. Absolutely do not come. It's very dangerous to come on one-way ticket. You'll be taking very significant amount of risk if you do so. All right. Next up, uh, H1B grace period. So what are some of the common questions that you receive about grace period when people are uh, facing a job loss situation? Um, 60 days grace period is what you are allowed when you lose the job. Everybody knows that. When does the grace period start? When does the grace period end? These are the main questions that come in. Now, let's assume that you're getting laid off on April 20th, but you're getting paid. I'm asking you this question, Emily. But they're getting paid until May 20th, Emily. When does the 60 days start? April 20th, April 21st, or May 21st? <laughs> Um, I like to, it, it depends, short answer, it depends. And it's a bit of a gray area. USCIS is not a hundred percent clear on that. Um, generally when the pay statements continue to look the same, um, it doesn't specify severance on the pay, but it's actually showing just regular payroll com continuing. And if the company doesn't withdraw during that time period, you can count that extra time as continuing your H-1B status, and then the grace period start after the pay ends. Um, that can be a bit riskier because there's, again, there's no specific guidance saying that, but we've not had a question about it. I mean, when we file transfers or change of status in this type of situation, we don't have to point out to USCIS, this is the day the person stopped working, and this is the day that they stopped getting paid. So this is the day that we say the grace period ends. We just file it with the most recent pay statement and let USCIS come to their own conclusion. And up till this point, we've never really had them question that or come back and ask, when did the person actually stop working? They're very used to seeing these 60 day grace period cases. So um, you can potentially go by the last date of the pay statement. Again, if the um, paychecks, the pay stub, look similar. It doesn't point out any job loss. It doesn't specify severance pay or something like that. Otherwise, if it's going to state severance pay or you're getting a lump sum or something like that, then you might want to go by the actual last date of employment to be on the safer side. And the good thing with the current USCIS policy is even if you have to go by that earlier date, you can buy yourself an extra six months of time by filing a change of status to B2 um, within that first 60 days after the last date of employment, now you have 60 days plus another six months to be able to continue your job search and file a change of status back to H1B. Um, and if that's filed in premium processing, USCIS will approve the change of status without you having to leave the country and get a new visa stamp. I mean, now when, I mean, practically with, with regards to the normal paycheck, when it is April 20th or May 20th, we haven't failed anywhere where we said that May 20th is where the 60 days starts. Now going to the end date though, let's say May 20th is there, 60 days ends up in June, July 20th, somewhere about June, July 19th. Now, can I file the H-1B application and don't start working until December of 2024? Will that be okay? Or should I start working within 60 days from the time I got laid off? Uh, yeah, you definitely can't hang out just because you filed the H-1B petition and not work. Um, so when the company is filing that transfer, they're going to list a specific start date of employment, which should be within the 60, 60th day. And so if they're saying you're going to start on July 20th and they file the petition by July 20th, you need to start working on July 20th. Uh, you can't continue to stay without working. The whole point of being in the U.S. in H-1B status is for employment. Um, so you've got to be employed during that time. Okay, let's go to the next topic, Emily. Now, people transfer from H-1B, one company to another company, company A to company B. 
As we know that, uh, everybody knows the rule that when company B files the H-1B transfer, um, people don't have to wait for the H-1B approval and they can start working with the receipt notice or the FedEx tracking number which says that it's been received by the immigration. They start working for it. Now, what if the H-1B transfer gets denied for many different reasons? Now, of course, we used to see a lot of denials when our dear Trump used to be the president, Emily, but we don't see that, which is good. Um, but, um, you know, well, we're expecting 50% chance for the Republicans, 50% chance for the Democrats. Um, well, we, have, we may end up into scenes where we get more denials. What happens if company B's H-1B gets denial? What options do they have? So we would first look at is company A's H-1B petition still valid, meaning has it not expired yet and has the company not withdrawn it? If that's the case, you may want to look at can I go back to company A because uh, there's a provision, it's considered a dormant H-1B approval. When you have two H-1Bs with two different companies, one of them is dormant and the other one is the active one, the one where you're actually working. So if company A's H-1B is still valid, has not expired, and it's just dormant because you're not working there anymore, and company is willing, you can go back to company A and be back in H-1B status as if the denial never happened. It, it has zero impact on you. During the time where the H-1B was pending, you have the receipt notice that shows why you have pay subs from company B, but you're back at company A, you're back in status. So that's generally the easiest of all the options if company A is willing. Um, beyond that, once you want the denial happens for company B, that the day after it puts you out of status. So you're no longer in H-1B status. So it makes it more difficult for you to file a change of status to any other type of visa or file a transfer to another employer that you think might be more successful uh, because you're not in status on the date of filing. So your only options there are to do some sort of nunc pro tunk request, which is basically asking USCIS to accept a late filing after you've already fallen out of status and put you back in status due to extraordinary circumstances, which would be the denial of the transfer. Um, depending on uh, administrations, sometimes those are more successful, sometimes those are less successful. Um, so not the best of options. And filing a change of status to other categories where there's long processing time or no premium processing, you don't want to be in limbo forever while you're waiting to see if they're going to accept this pro tunk request. So those may not be the best option. An appeal is not a great option either because those processing times are ever, or a motion to reopen or a motion to reconsider. Uh, those are all options, but they take so long that again, you're left in limbo until the case is actually reopened or the, the appeal ex is successful. You're continuing to stay out of status and you're technically not authorized to work. If you do stay and you do work while it's pending, if the motion or the appeal is successful, then you are fine the whole time. But if it's not successful, if the motion gets denied, if the appeal gets denied, you've been out of status that whole time and working without authorization that whole time. So it's a big risk in order to rely on a motion or an appeal. Um, so some other options may be to refile the transfer if you think that the grounds of um, denial can be overcome with additional documents. Maybe you change the SOC code to something that's um, that works better with the petition and the job duties. Um, in that situation, you still have to make the nunc pro tunk request because you're out of status at the time of filing, but it can be done in premium processing you don't have to wait six to eight months to figure out whether you're back in status or not. Um, if that nunc pro tunk request is, is successful, it puts you back in H-1B status, you can go back to work, you get that answer in 15 calendar days or business days now. Um, so that's also a good option. And then lastly, litigation may be an option, just depending on the reason for denial. Um, it may sometimes be faster than an appeal or a motion. Because in litigation, the government has to respond within 60 days. Uh, so those are your general options in the case where you've already started to work for company B and assuming that your I-94 has not expired with your old company in that situation. 
Emily, I have a couple of questions on the national interest waiver. I see a lot of questions coming on the national interest waiver. Padma from X, our Twitter, is asking the question whether she's working with an AI team, can she apply for the national interest waiver? Yeah, that definitely is a good option. You should consider applying in the national interest waiver, uh, especially if you're working in AI or security issues. It may become a little bit much better. You may, may require some recommendation letters from your uh, team manager who is working on the AI application. Definitely, that may uh, that may improve your chances in getting the national interest waiver. But I have some questions, Emily, for you. Um, let's assume that I'm going to file the I one. You know, I'm getting delayed in the palm labor certification. My I'm getting into very close to the fifth year right now, and uh, my company has put palm and hold right now. Can I just file an I one forty in national interest waiver under the normal processing? And if it's yeah. pending for more than one year, if it's pending for more than one year and it's not approved, can I apply for this H-1B extension beyond six years? Just like the way when the poem is pending for more than one year? Yeah, yeah, so it's either, either one, the labor certification is pending for at least 365 days or the I-140 is pending for at least 365 days before you hit your six year limit Yes, you can use that pending I-140 to um, extend your H-1B in one year increments. You get a seventh year extension in that situation. Emily, what if my I-140 in NIW gets <coughs> denied and I file so, an appeal, can I still file one year extension based on the original I-140 application pending? Yes. So the appeal, once it's filed, it, the case is treated as pending. And so if from the original date of filing till the till you get the denial, then you file the appeal and the appeal is still pending. If all that time adds up to at least 365 days, then you can use the pending appeal to also get a seventh year extension of the I-140 or the h one Emily, I'm filing the if I'm filing the national interest waiver, if I if it gets denied, does that mean that I can never file a national interest waiver again? Is it only one time? Definitely not. Um, yeah, if your circumstances change, I mean, a lot of NIW is how it's presented. So if the file can be presented in a different way that makes it more clear, easier to approve, definitely can refile it. If you have um, changed your field of endeavor, if you have additional documentation. There's lots of different things that happen after you filed once that may make you eligible later. So you can absolutely file again if you feel that your case is stronger later on. Uh, my poem has been recently filed and it won't be one year since the time of my six year expiration. While the poem is pending, can I still file the national interest waiver? Yeah, absolutely. The two are completely separate. The perm is with the Department of Labor. National interest waiver is with USCIS. Uh, there's no overlap between the two. You can have both going on at the same time. No issues at all. Uh, can I file NAW a national interest waiver when I'm in India directly? Yes. Yeah, so the I-140 doesn't require you to be in the U.S at all. I mean, the I-140 petition can be filed um, when you're outside the U.S. It's just an immigrant petition so that you can obtain the green card. So yes, a company or you can file self-petition NIW I-140 while you're outside the U.S. Once it's approved, then it gets transferred to the National Visa Center, assuming the priority date is current, or once it becomes current, you'll be contacted to begin consular processing of the green card where you'll submit everything through the National Visa Center and attend the visa interview at the consulate and then come to the U.S. directly on a green card. Do you agree with the statement of uh, uh, Berg where he says in the YouTube that national interest waiver is only for the scientists? Definitely not. Um, you can be um, business too. I mean, if you've developed a company and it's doing something that's in the national interest, you can get a national interest waiver. It's definitely not only for scientists. Uh, there's more people that use it that are scientists or in uh, that that field, but there's, there's no restrictions on what field it is if you can make a case. 
and uh, if I uh, national interest waiver is an EB2, guys, uh, it's not EB1. But let me ask you this question, Emily. If I get the national interest waiver approval, does that mean um, I cannot file, I cannot later convert myself into EB1A extraordinary ability? You absolutely can. And a lot of people file both at the same time. If you feel that you, you're able to meet the requirements of EB1A now, some people will file the EB1A and the NRW, two separate cases, but do it at the same time. In case the EB1A gets denied, at least you've got the EB2 approved and you've locked in your priority date. And then you can go back and always convert into EB1A later when you have developed more in your career and meet more of the criteria. Anything else, Emily, before we go to question and answers? Um, let's see. Nope, I think we can move on to questions and answers. A uh, question coming from Rajesh with the cybersecurity engineer. Can they file NAW? What is the success rate? Well, we can't just give the success rate, but I would say that if you are in the cybersecurity and if you are in a in a critical role, though, uh, and you can get a good recommendation letters from your company and uh, the particular cybersecurity you're working with, whether it's a financial organization or a particular organization that you're getting, you definitely have a better chance. But we can't give the success rate directly, though. Uh, it's better to evaluate it now. Rajesh, remember that this is an EB2 application only. This is not EB1A, this is still EB2. Um, Sai from X says, can I get a one-year H1B extension if my I-140 is pending with a previous employer for more than one year? Technically, yes. So uh, the I-140 <coughs> itself, for some reason, if it got delayed and you've moved from that company, as long as the company has not withdrawn it and it is still pending, for 365 days, by the time you hit your six-year limit, you can rely on that I-140 to get a seventh-year extension with any other company. It doesn't have to be only with the company that filed the I-140. Uh, question with regards to the 60-day grace period. What about the H-4EAD? Then can they continue working on the 60-day grace period? The answer is yes. They can continue working on the 60-day grace period, but if they move on to B-2, definitely they have to stop working uh, if they, um, if 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 the person, if the main applicant, the H-1B applicant gets a job within 60 days and joins the job, even though the H-4 EAD person has an EAD with the previous company, they can continue working with the previous company's H-4 EAD as long as the main applicant gets a job within 60 days and starts working for the company B. Um, official Telugu Affairs from X also says, what happens if I file my perm in the sixth year? Can I come back to the U.S. after 12 months of wait time and apply for the seventh year extension? Basically, yes. So um, if you max out of H-1B time while your perm is still pending and you decide to exit the U.S., you exit the U.S., you wait until your perm will have been pending for 365 days, back up 180 days from there and file the H-1B extension requesting the start date 180 days from now, which is day 366 in consular processing, get that petition approved. And then three months before the H-1B will start, you can go for stamping to get the H-1B stamped. And then you can come in when the H-1B takes effect on day 366, and you'll have that one year extension. So yes, you can do that. It's gotta be consular processing. So you have to wait, get the H-1B approved first, get the visa stamp and then come back in. So you can't come back in and then file the H-1 extension because you don't have an H-1 to come back on. Um, but yes, you can do that. And the important point is you don't have to wait until day 365 to start the H-1B extension. You can start it six months in advance and file early. Question still coming on the National Interest Waiver. I am a medical assistant. Can I file the National Interest Waiver? Well, just by proving that you are a medical, uh, medical uh, assistant, it does not by automatically qualify as a National Interest Waiver. You have to prove that the endeavor, the work that you do is, is in the national interest. So, for example, if you are working with the COVID vaccine at the time of COVID, I mean, definitely every national interest waiver application that the officer sees the COVID word or something like that, they just approve those things at that point of time. 
so it must be in the national interest. So you have to show that your endeavor is definitely something greater than just a normal medical assistant. Um, Vishal has this question from Facebook. Can I find the national interest payable? My perm is already in process. Absolutely, you can. Um, absolutely, you can. You can file the national interest waiver while your perm is in progress. Shirastra Tegala has this question on national interest waiver. Um, how, what is the eligibility criteria of national interest waiver? Well, we already addressed that in the first 10 minutes of our video. How to improve the profile? For, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, you get the evaluation done um, by our great lawyer called Karim Zivani from our office. He does the national interest waiver and also um, Rebecca Chen and uh, Ryan Wick does the national interest waiver. When you get the evaluation done, if they don't feel that you are meeting the requirement, they will give you the guidelines for the next six months or the next four months or next one year. What are the steps that you can do to get the national interest waiver, you know, to increase the probability of the national interest waiver? Um, also, sometimes when you file a national interest waiver application, if you get the denial, uh, that may be a point that you need to look into the reasons for the denial, especially when we see some other people coming into our office, say, I got the national interest waiver denied, look at it. When we look at it, we can improve upon that one and then file another national interest waiver application. Sometimes if you are not qualified for it, maybe you will do some extra steps to qualify for the national interest waiver. So you should consider those things if you are uh, if you think so the national interest. Whenever you are making an appointment, though, the particular work that you are doing, please put in a bullet points. Why do you think so that it is in the national interest? For example, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is definitely in the national interest because it's an essential part of the IT industry. If the cybersecurity is not there, um, then definitely we are not going to be functional with the IT. Uh, the developments that we are going to are not going to be there. It's going to be damaging for the United States. At the same time, you have to link yourself to that particular endeavor. Now, cybersecurity is definitely everybody agrees that it's a national interest paper. But what is your contribution? What is that you are doing in benefiting the United States? You need to write it down in a bullet points in seven to ten bullet points then make a consultation. It'll be easier for our lawyer to evaluate, to make sure that if you meet the requirements, then what are the next steps to do? Uh, Vivek says, how long can one be abroad while their standalone H4 EAD is pending? So I'm assuming that the person already has their H4 in place with an I-94 that's valid then the spouse got the uh, i-140 approval so now you've filed just the i-765 application and you are physically present in the u.s when that was filed once it's filed you can exit the u.s while it's pending it has zero impact on it um, and then you can come back into the u.s once that ead is approved of course you have to come back before your visa stamp expires or before your h4 is expiring but beyond that there's no limit on how long you can stay outside the u.s while you're waiting for the ead to be approved amrish has this question is h4 better or f1 better to study in united states um what happened um it's a it's it's a debate amrish whether it's f1 is better or h4 is better uh, there are some different advantages. There are some fee advantages if you're going to the state school on the H4. Uh, when it go to the F1, they may charge you double the fees. Um, F1 has an advantage of getting an OPT and STEM extension if you have a degree that you completed in the STEM field. Up to a three-year work permit is there. You don't have that in the H4 field. Um, I would definitely Amrish, I would suggest to people that irrespective of whether you choose the H4 or F1, the best path would definitely be have your spouse file the labor and I-140 or national interest waiver if they're eligible. Because if you have the I-140 approval for the spouse, you get the employment authorization. Now, if you have the H4 EAD and you want you are on F1, most probably the choice will be H4 EAD may be a better choice because of the fee structure and the employment authorization does not come with any restriction when it comes to the H4 EAD. 
when the F1 OPT or STEM extension does come with restrictions, you have to do only a particular kind of jobs. So definitely there may be a little bit edge on H4 EAD as compared to F1. Now, when it comes to just only H4 or F1, probably F1 may give an advantage because of the employment authorization you get it after you complete your F1. Uh, Zora <coughs> says, do you have any update on the perm delay litigation we recently filed? Uh, so we actually have two cases going on, our original case, and then we uh, filed another case specifically for people who have filed using the new flag version of the perm form. On that particular case, it's interesting because through Freedom of Information Act requests, we know that the government has yet to come up with any training for their officers. They don't have a plan in place for adjudicating these new uh, cases on the new version of the form. They think that the law hasn't changed. Why would we need to come up with anything? Well, this version of the form has changed the way the questions are asked. And there's a lot of gray area and um, not very clear instructions or guidance from DOL on how to fill out the form. Um, so we have filed a second lawsuit just for cases that were filed after that point. In that lawsuit, we filed a motion for summary judgment um, this week, which basically asks the court to decide the case in our favor without the need of going through a full trial based on the information and data that we already have. <coughs> We've gotten through depositions of DOL officials. Um, so we're getting a lot of good information from it, getting new ways to attack these kinds of delays getting information that tells us there shouldn't be a delay at all. I mean, based on the number of officers they have, they can easily handle 144,000 perms a year and they never get that many perms a year. They can't claim that, oh, the filings have gone up so much that we don't have the capacity because way back in 2005, when they invented perm, they said we could handle 140,000 a year and process them in 45 days. Um, so we're getting all of this information through these lawsuits and through Freedom of Information Act um, and using that as part of that motion for summary judgment. So it's all still pending. and It'll be up to the judge to decide things from here. Um, Chetan has this question. Um, my I-140 EB2 approved from 2014. My new employer wants to file an EB2 NIW. Would they be able to port the date? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, they can put the date into NAW, not a problem at all. Um, some of the employers are choosing to go with national interest waiver. The reason is that, uh, one, delaying the labor certification. Second, they are unable to do recruitment because of the, uh, the way Labor Department has designed the recruitment process is that they have to hire the minimally eligible person. When they advertise in the labor certification, they get individual applications. If they don't hire the minimal, minimum eligible person, though, then they have to, they cannot continue with the labor certification. Now, in the industry, that doesn't work that way. People hire the best talented people. And you may be the best talented people, but if they have a minimally qualified for the job and they do, can't hire them, the labor certification will fall down. And that's one of the reasons why we see some of the employers are choosing the national interest waiver route rather than actually going through the labor certification. Uh, one other person, SP uh, from YouTube is asking the question on the cybersecurity, that person is, uh, can a person combine NIW and EB1A application? No, you cannot combine EB1A and NIW into one application. It has to be two separate applications. The requirements for NIW are quite different than that of the EB1. Now, there are some overlappings there, definitely there, EB1A. You can file two separate applications, EB1A and National Interest Waiver. At the same time, you can do that. Uh, but you have to separate it. You can't file it together in one application. Um, Texmex says, I have a pending 485, but my job title changed due to an internal reorganization. I used to be a manager with direct reports, but not anymore on the new role. Does that mean there will need to be a fresh perm? Um, not necessarily, especially after you filed the 485, that's where AC21 comes in. So assuming your 485 has been pending for at least 180 days, 
then as long as your new position is a similar occupation, you can continue the 485 with the same company, even with a different job. So what is similar occupation? Um, it, it's very broad. Um, so assuming you're doing basically the same job duties as you were before, and the main difference is you don't have the direct reports, then no, you, that's considered the same similar occupation. It's not the sim same exact job, just similar occupation. Um, then you qualify for AC21. Your employer can submit a supplement J for the new job and your 485 can continue. Um, question that is coming from Rifat. Um, um, he wants us to talk about the day one CPT people traveling to outside the country and coming back. Simple answer, no, don't travel it. Uh, we don't consider day one CPT universities as completely legal. So there are issues with people when they're traveling to the United States, they're asking questions and they're sending a lot of trouble. Uh, they're asking, hey, where is your university? I mean, some of the guys don't even know where their university was. Um, so definitely not a good thing uh, for the day one CPT. People for all different reasons don't travel. Atani Roy from YouTube has this question. Uh, filed ED1C I140, do you recommend filing in premium processing? We absolutely recommend going to premium processing. Get it approved as fast as possible. That is the best thing that you can do. Uh, Sunny says, the company is going to file for I140 and 485 concurrently. How many months will it take to get the advanced parole and the EAD? Well, EADs processing time has gotten much better. It's a few weeks to a couple of months, but APs are still taking over a year to process. And I'm not seeing much plans from USCIS to fix that. For some reason, they treat APs much differently than EADs uh, based on some recent statement from the uh, director of USCIS at a conference recently. Um, you know, they think advanced parole is discretionary, and so they have to look into the specifics of each case before they can actually decide whether to issue advanced parole. I don't know why, but that's what they're doing. Uh, question, is there a separate queue for the national interest waiver? Unfortunately, no. Uh, the waiting period is the same as EB2. Uh, unfortunately, EB2 is behind EB3, though. So you can't even change from EB2 to EB3, the National Interest Waiver, which a perm labor certification, if you get an EB2 I-140 approval, you can use the same perm to change the EB3, but not true when it comes to the National Interest Waiver. It only goes in one column, EB2, and it's backlogged forever for it. Uh, Shining Shreya says, if someone with an approved I-140 goes back to India for some time and the employer revokes the H-1B, how can the person come back to the U.S.? Do they need to go through the lottery or can another company transfer the H-1B? So you don't have to go through the lottery because you have an approved I-140 that exempts you from the six-year limit. Um, you do need to have that H-1B filed before your priority date becomes current because once your date becomes current you can only get a one-year h1b and you want to get a three-year h1b so before your final action date becomes current any company can file an h1b uh, for you without going through the lottery it's not subject to the cap they have to request consular processing because you're outside the u.s so it's not like a transfer or anything like that once it gets approved you go for your visa stamping you come into the u.s then you have three years to get new labor certification, new I-140 approved, and file your 485 when the date becomes current. Ooh, Sahi Shihanshu. I mean, this guy looks to be very good. I'm working as a uh, full-time teaching, he's, he's teaching uh, full-time courses in AI and cybersecurity in state university. I'm in STEM OPT now. Am I eligible for the EB2 NIW? Well, looks like a very ideal candidate, not because you are in the national interest to me, according to me, because you are not only, you are providing a lot of people that are going to come into the labor market that are going to invent the AI that is going to do the cybersecurity. You are in both of those things. You look very good for national interest waiver. 
But I do have a very other good suggestion for you, Zutu Sahib. You may actually be even qualified for EB1A category, which is extraordinary ability. USCIS has been very lenient for the people who have STEM, and particularly in IT, in cybersecurity and AI, where people are working on those things, they're getting their EB1A getting approved fast. And you have also another possibility, the e, a National Interest Waiver and EB1A, you can just file it by yourself. You don't have to have your university file for it. But if your university wants to file it, there may be one other category you may want to consider, which is EB1B category, which is for outstanding researchers and professors, which since you are in the teaching profession, you may even fall into that particular criteria too. So EB2, EB1, I would prefer EB1 for you, EB1A for you though. Um, Abhijit says, now that EB2, EB3 India have been stagnant in the last two visa bulletins, can we expect forward movement in the fourth quarter? Well, we've said a number of times we predict the visa bulletin and we go wrong more than anyone else <laughs> because we are always asked our predictions. Uh, I would predict, no, there's not going to be much, if any, forward movement in the fourth quarter. This year, there's no spillover like we had during the COVID years, and EB2 rest of the world is not current. So there aren't going to be any leftover visas from rest of world to go to EB2 India, which would allow the EB2 India date to move forward. That 7% cap is going to be your limit uh, whenever rest of world is not current. So I don't think there's going to be much of any. Um, you know, another one asks for, you know, when will it get to 2015? Obviously, we were at January 2015 in 2020. We fast forwarded four years and we've gone backwards. Um, no, I don't think 2015 is going to be current in the next couple of years. Uh, the latest prediction we got from uh, Charlie Oppenheim, who's the former uh, head of the uh, Visa Bulletin, said it might take up to seven years to get back to where we were in October 2020. Uh, question um, from Upkar Singh Lodi. His company has been acquired by some other company. Perm has already been fired by, uh, by the previous company. Will that impact in progress of Perm? No, it does not impact. If, if company A is a wired by company B and company B has taken the responsibilities of company A's immigration assets and liabilities. We call it our word as successor of interest though. Company B can use company A's labor certification in filing the I-140. They don't have to file a new I-140 to get, uh, the, the, sorry, they don't have to file a new POM application if it meets the requirement of the successor of interest, normally 90% of the acquisitions will meet the requirement of the successor of interest. Thus, by doesn't need to require to file a prevailing wage, recruitment, and filing the home labor again. Um, Santosh says, what are the interview waiver eligibility at the 485 stage? Good question, because there's no um, guidance on that. Uh, it's just kind of a policy that started before Trump that they would no longer interview most employment-based 485s. And then Trump came in and said, no, everyone has to be interviewed. And so everyone was being interviewed. And then COVID happened. And so they stopped interviewing people and kind of went back to the old way. Um, so most employment-based 485s don't get interviewed. Um, the ones that do 90% of the time, in my experience, is because there's some sort of criminal issue in, in one of the applicant's history. Um, beyond that, it's typically if there's some sort of uh, issue in the company, then interviews are more common. A couple of them are just random, but the, by and large, most people don't get interviewed anymore. Uh, Ranyan is asking this question. Um, do we need to have certain years of experience uh, before we file a national interest waiver? No. If you're just fresh graduate, but if you have the caliber, you're working in that particular field and you're very good in that particular endeavor and it's in the national interest, you don't need to have 10, 20 years experience. Um, a minimum experience will do it. 
uh, question that is coming from Vishnu. Uh, I have three published documents on toxicology. Ooh, that's very dangerous and good for, uh, I mean, toxicology is <laughs> a lot of toxins there. And did masters in pharmacology and toxicology and clinical with clinical trial track. Currently on H4, waiting for H4 EAD. Can I do the National Interest Waiver? Yeah, you can. You can consider it. However, Vishnu, I think so that you're pursuing the H4 EAD path. You may definitely want to think about filing a National Interest Waiver, but at the same time, you may want to consider in the long run, probably going to EB1A, because as you know that this EB2 may not get you the green card. It only gets you a priority date, but it may not get you green card. But with your caliber, what you're speaking about, particularly in toxicology industry and pharmacology industry, you may want to consider moving on to EB1A. If you file a national interest waiver, you will get the priority date. Unfortunately, you cannot retain your wife's priority date for you. You cannot transfer it to you. But if you do the uh, EB2 though, you will get a priority date if the I-140 is approved. Later on, if you qualify for EB1A, you can put this date to that date as the priority date for EB1 is backlogged right now. You may want to get the National Interest Waiver first. I know you recently came from India, most probably, I think so. It may take a little bit of time for digest what I said, but if you, uh, if you uh, record this session and hear it a couple of times, you will get an idea of what I'm speaking about. Sai says my H-1B was picked this year and my employer filed a change of status, but some of my friends said I should have gone for consular processing. Which one is better? I have two more years of OPP time. Well, in our opinion, don't listen to your friends. <laughs> we prefer consular or change of status, change of status, not consular <coughs> processing. Um, yes, you're giving up two years of your OPP time. Um, yes, you've got to pay more, part, more of your salary goes to withholding the, the taxes. But for people that go for consular processing and think that any time in the next three years, I can activate my H-1B by going and getting the visa stamp, they don't understand that getting a consular processing H-1B approval does not mean you're counted in the cap yet. You're only counted in the cap when you've actually changed status to H-1B or gotten the visa stamp in your passport. So all these people thinking, oh, I have three years to activate my H-1B. What happens when you get laid off a year from now? What happens when you decide you want a new job? What happens when the company goes out of business? You can't transfer that H-1B to anyone else because you haven't activated it yet, which means you're not counted in the cap yet. So that's a huge risk to take just to save a little money on the taxes or just to buy extra time of your H-1B time. Just get on the H-1B, get the green card process started, get your I-140 approved. Then you, the six year limit is no longer an issue and saving a little bit of money on your um, taxes is not worth losing that H-1B cap number when there's only a 25% chance of getting selected this year. This is coming up very frequently. The employers are, some of the employers are promoting the consular processing because not only you save the money, they also save the money too. And that's the reason why they are encouraging, don't fall into the trap. Believe us guys, 50% of the people who file the consular processing eventually don't get the stamping done if they are already in United States. Either they lose the job, or whatever the things Emily has said will happen. Don't do that. Get the cons get the change of status. Don't go for the consular process. It's not worth for you to save the money right now. It's worth to get on to H1B as soon as possible. You have the flexibility once you are on the H1B. Deepak says currently my STEM OPT application is pending for 110 days. Is it okay to apply for the renewal of my passport, which will expire in eight months? Yes, no problem at all. Uh, your passport has no uh, bearing on the STEM OPT application. The I-765 can still be approved and your new passport can come and the passport number can change. You don't have to <coughs> update anything with USCIS. Uh, my priority date is July, 2016. Um, my kid is going to age out in two years. Uh, do you recommend Canada study rather than PR? 
one thing i don't know about all those things but i would recommend one thing though if your priority date is july 2016 under the current conditions though assuming you are from india it will be very unlikely that you're going to get the green card uh, priority dates current for you within two years one of the misconception people has is that if you move the kids to f1 and the priority date becomes current can we still file them in adjustment of status the answer is yes they don't have to be an H4 to file the adjustment of status. As long as they meet the under 21 under the Child Service Protection Act, we can file the adjustment of status, no problem, none whatsoever at all. Upkar says, what can be done if my company is acquired by some other company, but the perm was already filed? What is the imp impact to an in-progress perm? Well, most mergers and acquisition situation, the um, surviving company that you moved to is qualified as a successor in interest. That means that they can continue the process of the former company. So the perm just continues. Once it gets certified, the new company will then file the I-140 petition with documentation of the transaction, the acquisition, and they have to state that they're continuing to offer the same job, the same salary, the same work location, the same job duties that the original company was offering and that they are the successor in interest. Um, and it's a pretty smooth process, so not a big deal, as long as they are a successor in interest. Vitali has this question. My company is willing to do the H-1B amendment so that my spouse is going to get a premium processing H-4 EAD. Uh, what are the changes that that are justified for amendment? What are the will there be any risk in the I-485? Now, what this person is asking is that typically what happens is that when people get married, people come into the United States, they want to work immediately, and their spouse has an I-140 approval. They want to apply for the H-4 EAD. It takes a long time, four to six months for them to get it. Or recently, the person got an I-140 approval. Now the spouse wants to get the H-4 plus EAD. H4 EAD, or sometimes the person is moving from F1 to the H4 EAD. They don't want delay in getting the EAD application. What they do is that if the main applicants, H1B, if they've, if their extension is not ready yet, they can still file an amendment and file the premium processing, attach the H1B amendment with the H4 and EAD, file it together, get all the amendment, uh, amendment plus extension plus H4 and EAD, all of them approved at the same time. Now, the question is that what are the changes that is justified? Nothing at all. Don't have to do anything. Or if you want to make any changes, well, increase $1 salary. Is it required? Maybe not. Or you can add your apartment or your home as an additional job in filing those things. Um, they don't check those things. They are not that strict on those things. They don't care about those things. And will it cause any problem at a later date on 485 application? Absolutely not. It will not be any problem at all, none whatsoever at all. Uh, Civil Engineer says, are F1 students allowed to start startups in the US? What are the important things they need to keep in mind if they want to start? Um, good question, and we're seeing a lot of that now. Actually, uh, at um, the NAFSA conference in Hawaii last fall, that was my presentation with a couple of um, uh, DSOs from universities. So there are um, ways that it can be done. The easiest way to make sure there are no issues are when you're on OPT. OPT time, you are allowed to uh, be an owner of a company. You can start your own company. As long as the work you are doing is directly related to your field of study, not really any restrictions when you're on OPT. Gets a little trickier when you're on STEM OPT because now it's got to be paid employment. It has to be at least 20 hours per week. Your company has to be an E-Verify and you've got to have someone that is training you, providing that supervision through that training plan. So that's where you might have to bring on a partner or have someone else who's not on an F1 um, being there to provide that for the company. If you don't have OPT or STEM OPT, if you're still um, just studying, um, you might look into whether CPT is an option for you to do some of those activities. If not, then you've just got to be careful that the things that you're doing don't rise to the level of unauthorized employment. 
You can be as a hobby, you can do it, you know, not making money. But once you start turning this into a real business, that's where you've got to have employment authorization in order to continue. Anything else, Emily? Before we close? I guess we are out of time. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, as a reminder, we do uh, consultations all the time for people that want more specific details about their situation. Uh, as we talked about NIW quite a bit, um, definitely you can set up an appointment with any of our attorneys, um, Kareem, Giovanni, Ryan Wilk, or Rebecca Chen to discover whether you might qualify for that. Same thing for EB1A category and then just any other immigration issues. Um, if you want to have a consultation with any of our attorneys, you can go to rnlawgroup.com. Our calendars are all there online. You can select your attorney, select the date and time that's most convenient to you, upload documents, up, um, provide a brief description so that we can make the most use of your time. Thank you very much.